In this video, we're going to think about the traditional square of opposition. We're going to think about what must be true in order for another proposition to be false. So if one proposition is false, what proposition must be true? Or if one proposition is true, what must be false? Hi, I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. You might be like me, wanting to increase your critical thinking skills, and one way to do that is to learn traditional logic. And at my website, I've developed an extensive tutorial on traditional verbal style logic. Now in this video, we're going to use Socratic logic by Peter Kreeft as a reference, and in the next video, we'll be working through some exercises from that very video. I think it's kind of cool, the ambience of this video. I wanted just to test this to see what it would be like filming this in the relatively dark atmosphere. But I know that's not realistic, so let me turn the light back on. We want to go from a state of darkness to a state of light, so to speak. We want to develop our critical thinking skills in a clear manner. And I'm sorry that my chair is so squeaky, but it is what it is. So if we turn to the table of contents from Socratic Logic by Dr. Peter Kreeft, we'll see that chapter seven deals with contradiction. What is a contradiction? The square of opposition, existential import, tricky propositions on the square, and some practical uses of the square of opposition. And in the next video, we will work through some exercises from this very textbook. But I want to set the stage, so to speak, a little bit to think about the square of opposition. So in traditional logic, you often learn about the three acts of the mind. And this is a good way to break down logical reasoning. Because if you think about a syllogism, like all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, to even engage in that type of argumentation requires propositions and to have propositions, you should have some terms. So we really have a three-step process, so to speak. We have three different components. So the first act of the mind is often called simple apprehension. This is where we form ideas and concepts. We create terms, for example, men or mortal. Now, from an Aristotelian scholastic perspective, we don't have innate ideas. We don't have ideas built into our minds from the outset, so to speak. We have to go out into the world and discover things. We learn through experience primarily. We learn about men and that men are mortal through experience. Now, the second act of the mind deals with forming propositions. This deals with judgments. This is where we affirm or deny something, where we say this is true or this is false. For example, all men are mortal. We're forming a proposition. We're making a judgment. We're declaring this is the case. And then the third act of the mind is where we get to inference or reasoning. So the classic example, of course, is all men are mortal, Socrates is man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The first two propositions are premises, and then we infer this third proposition, the conclusion. And we infer it, again, based on these two given propositions. Notice that these are propositions, so the second act of the mind is involved, and these propositions contain terms, so the first act of the mind is involved. Now, in traditional logic, one big topic deals with categorical propositions. These are the most famous type of propositions, and there are four, based on quantity and quality. So with quantity comes universal propositions and particular propositions. With quality comes affirmative and negative propositions. So there are two features, quantity and quality. So there are four basic types of categorical propositions. Although in traditional logic, there's more propositions covered, and they analyze these propositions in great depth. But in any case, we can think about these in terms of the categorization or the symbolic notation of AIEO. So first off, we have universal propositions. We have particular propositions. We have affirmative and negative. So we can have the universal affirmative proposition, all SRP, we can have the universal negative proposition, no SRP. We can have the particular affirmative proposition, some SRP, and the particular negative proposition, some S or not P. And there's a famous mnemonic in Latin, affirmo and nego. Affirmo means I affirm. And notice the vowels A and I. These are affirmative propositions. So affirmative propositions get the letter A or I, depending if it's universal or particular. And then we have nego, which means I deny. Again, notice the vowels, E and O, so E and O propositions. So the universal affirmative proposition is A. The particular affirmative proposition is I, affirmo. The universal negative proposition is E. 
The particular negative is O, nego, E and O. Also note, because this confuses a lot of people, when we're saying sum SRP, for example, sum means at least one, maybe all. It leaves open the possibility of all. So for example, if I say some men are mortal, that's a true proposition. And it leaves all open the possibility that all men are mortal. Okay, great. So with that in mind, we can get into the traditional square of opposition. So let's do that. So here we have the traditional square of opposition. And this is common sense. So yes, you can go through the rules. And these rules, I basically, well, I did. I just copied them from Peter Kreef's textbook. But they make intuitive sense. They make logical sense. So it's really about understanding. You don't have to memorize these rules. Just practice the square of opposition and think about the logic of it, and these rules will come naturally. So here we have the square of opposition. We can relate our four types of propositions. We have the, the A, universal affirmative. We have the I, particular affirmative. The E, the negative universal. The O, the particular negative. So for example, let's think A represents, we're going to use the same exact subject, the same exact predicate. So A might represent all men are mortal. E will represent no men are mortal. So hopefully you can read my writing there. The I will represent some men are mortal. As you can see, I do these videos in a very amateurish way. And the O would represent some men are not mortal. Now, if we know, for example, that this proposition here is true, all men are mortal, if we know for a fact that, that is true, what does that imply about this proposition, the O proposition, this corresponding proposition, some men are not mortal? Well, clearly, if all men are mortal is true, it must be false that some men are not mortal. So here we have the strongest type of opposition, namely contradiction. We have a difference both in the quantity and the quality of the proposition, so A versus O. Or we might think of the opposition between E and I. Again, these are contradictories. They have the strongest opposition. They differ both in quantity and quality. So a contradiction, and this is from Peter Kreef's textbook, pages 175 to 176, of two contradictories. If one is true, the other is false. And if one is false, the other is true. We can also think about contraries. We have contrary propositions and subcontrary propositions. So here, contrary propositions, we're dealing with A and E. And subcontrary sub propositions, we're dealing with I and O. So contraries cannot both be true, but they can both be false. With subcontrary propositions, both can be true, but subcontraries cannot both be false. And then we have subalternation or super alternation. So if we're thinking about the relationship between A and I, or E and O, these are alternates. So with subalternation, if the universal proposition is true, then the particular proposition that comes under it must also be true. Also, if the particular proposition is false, then the universal must be false. We're dealing with super alternation. And again, this makes intuitive sense. So if I say all men are mortal is true, there's no way that no men are mortal is true. So if this is true, this must be false. But it's possible that both can be false. So let's think about the various possibilities here. And there's a nice, actually there's a nice diagram of this in Peter Kreef's textbooks. So let me flip to that really quickly. Let's see, I think this is 170 something, right? So let me see if I can get there quickly. So here we can think about all the different possibilities. So let's say E is, the E type of proposition is true. That implies that the A is false. 
the A is true, E is false. So we can think about all the different types of possibilities here. So, for example, if, let's say, the proposition is true, if this is true, then the A must be false, right? But then we can think about, for example, well, if A is false, then O, if we're thinking about this contradictory relation, must be true, right? And remember, with this subaltern relationship, if E is true, then O is true. Moreover, if E is true with the contradictory relationship, this I must be false. So we can think about all the different possibilities there. Or let's say that we know that with this A, E, I, and O, let's say, for example, that we know for a fact that O is false, that's given. What would that imply about the corresponding propositions? So we would know then that I excuse me, that A, excuse me, I was, I was originally going to move to the I proposition, but I like thinking about contradictions first. So if O is false, then A must be true, right? Moreover, if O is false, then the subaltern relationship, if this is false, this must be true. And if this is true, this I, then E must be false. So we can reason through the various relationships here. And in the next video, if I have the paper here, I know I have it somewhere. I guess I didn't, did I bring it with me? Or um, I guess I didn't. But what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to go through some of these exercises starting on page 178. So we're going to determine, so for part A, we're going to say, to disprove each of the following propositions, what proposition must be proved? In other words, give the contradictory of each of the following propositions. So we'll work through a few of these, and then we'll go to part B, where we're going to evaluate the following inferences, and then we'll do some of part three, where we know that this proposition, let's say, is false, then what does it imply about this proposition? Is it true, false, or is it just unknown? So that's the next video. I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com, and one of my recommendations is this book, Socratic Logic by Peter Kreeft. It's an excellent way to study traditional logic. I also hope you check out my website, AmateurLogician.com, because there I provide for free an extensive tutorial on traditional verbal style logic. There are over 40 entries to study traditional logic there. See you soon in the next video. Bye for now, and good luck, be well.